Super Metroid. You already know what this game is. I'll start with my own beginning. When I was three years old, I saw this game for the first time. I don't know where I was or who I was with, but there was a TV with Super Metroid on it, and in that same room, there was someone's pet snake. The smell of the snake's heater is one of those smells that instantly takes me back to watching what was likely the first video game that I had ever seen. I remember seeing the orange character shooting the blue beam exactly like this. I don't know why that specific moment is something that my brain decided to hold onto, but it's one of my earliest memories. I never actually picked Super Metroid back up until I was around 9 years old. I tried the game out on an online emulator, and I immediately hated playing the game with a crappy keyboard. I think the site was called Vizzed, and I couldn't even find a normal version of the game. I had some Justin Bailey kind of hack. I quickly lost interest because of the terrible keyboard controls and didn't pick the game back up until 2010 when I got a Wii for Christmas. The very first game that I bought on the Wii Virtual Console was Super Metroid, and it was then that I finally got to properly try the game. I had to play with a GameCube controller because that's all I had at the time. Once again, the controls felt like ass because I had to play with the GameCube D-pad or the GameCube analog stick. I still had fun, but Super Metroid didn't really stand out to me very much, compared to all of the other Metroid games I also got for Christmas that year. It was still an amazing game, but I didn't really revisit it nearly as much as any of the other games. It took a few years for me to really appreciate the game fully, but even then, it didn't place particularly high in my rankings. I never had any specific issues with the game, but it also just wasn't my favorite. I replayed all of the games again and again for many years, and Super has since grown to be my second favorite Metroid game and second favorite video game of all time. I don't really know how it happened, but it's no secret that Super Metroid is just that good of a game. Super Metroid has long been widely recognized for being the best Metroid game in the series, and one of the best games of all time, period. It benefits not only from a favorable comparison to the first two games, but also a favorable comparison to any game in the series. In more recent years, Metroid Prime and Metroid Dread have both supplanted that title for many fans. It largely depends on who you ask, but these three games are the ones that always come up when discussing favorite Metroid games. I'd like to see if I can figure out what exactly Super Metroid does to earn itself this reputation as one of the Golden 3 best Metroid games. I know that there are already countless videos on Super Metroid, so you might hear some points others have already made. Despite that, I'm hoping that this video offers something new to the ongoing conversation about Super Metroid. I want to again remind the viewer that I'm choosing to take a perspective of examining these games from the perspective of someone playing them in 2023. Super Metroid is widely regarded as one of the greatest games in the entire genre, and one of the greatest games of all time. Of all time does include the time we currently live in, and I'm simply not interested in excusing the game just because it was made on the Super Nintendo, or just because it's from an older era. There is certainly validity in taking things in the context of their release, but that's not the kind of discussion I care to have in this video. I said as much in my Metroid NES video, and some commenters seem to miss that part, so I'm giving another chance for viewers to be informed. The last Metroid is in captivity. The galaxy is at peace. Super Metroid opens with a cutscene recap of the first two games, presented as some kind of mission log being typed out by Samus. Right away we're hit with production values previously unseen in the series, with these new cinematics. This is the first time that Metroid even tried having an intro. The increased production values are afforded by the Super Nintendo's superior hardware, and it seems that Super Metroid intends to take full advantage of what the console can do. Animated segments and artwork depict all of the key events leading us to the events of this game. After defeating Mother Brain and all of the Metroids on their homeworld, Samus delivers the last Metroid to a research facility to be studied. Not long after, Ridley reveals himself to still be alive. It is discovered that he had been tracking Samus and waiting for her to leave the Metroid so that he could attack Ceres' space colony. Samus intervenes and tracks Ridley back to planet Zebus. It's up to Samus to retrieve the larval Metroid and unwind the mystery of Ridley's revival and return to Zebus. What's interesting about the story is the way that it's communicated to the player. Super Metroid 
does open with a lengthy cutscene and lots of text, but after that intro, the entire rest of the story is communicated directly through gameplay. The intro of Super Metroid was my introduction to the events of Metroid 1 and 2, and honestly, I didn't find myself very invested in the plot when I first played this game on that emulator. Characters like Mother Brain and the Metroids are introduced and killed off in the same breath. The intro is effective in informing the player, but I have seen firsthand that it doesn't do much to invest the newcomer. I can't blame Super too harshly for this, because I was the one that decided to start with Game 3, after all. There's only so much an intro of a sequel can do to fully invest the newcomer into the overarching narrative. But aside from that recap, the intro intrigues with its mystery. Ceres Station is under attack. Ceres Space Colony is known for being an excellent invisible tutorial, while also effectively setting up the premise of the game. General physics and jumping are introduced to the player, but this segment also gives the player a chance to investigate the situation. The corpses along the floor belong to the scientists from the intro, and the Metroid is missing. It's unclear if the shattered glass is from the Metroid escaping on its own, or someone else. Deeper into the facility, an empty room with the encased larva sits on the floor. There's no music here, which gives this scene an air of uncertainty. A glowing pair of eyes appear in the darkness above the Metroid, and Ridley is revealed in an ambush. I love this moment of pause with Ridley's eyes, because it characterizes Ridley in a way that separates him from all of the other enemy and boss encounters. Ridley is a giant pterodactyl thing, but even with his imposing mass, he is also a calculated foe with intellect. Metroid bosses are large, beastly creatures that hardly demonstrate any advantage from their intellect. But here in Super Metroid, we are given a look at what separates Ridley from your usual Metroid boss. And the other huge thing about this encounter is the interactivity of this scene. The player maintains control of Samus at all times. It's difficult for me to overstate the importance of this design decision. Other Metroid games have decided to introduce things like bosses or story moments through cutscenes. Super Metroid could have replaced all of Series Station with some kind of cutscene. Cutscenes certainly have their own potential benefits, but this commitment to interactivity is a huge appeal of Super Metroid for all of its own benefits. What I really like about this design decision is that it even further connects the player to Samus's headspace. A huge thing about video games that separates them from other media is that they are interactive, and Super Metroid demonstrates a unique way of utilizing that potential here. When you're playing as Samus, walking into this room, it's up to you to take action. You're not sitting on the bleachers watching Samus deal with the situation, you're an active participant in the investigative process. You gotta figure out what to do about this mysterious situation. Even though the only thing the player can actually do is wait for Ridley to show up, that doesn't change the importance of this commitment to interactivity. Whether or not the player can actually die here is entirely irrelevant to the effect that the interactivity has on the engagement of the player. Battling Ridley is a rather simple affair of dodging fireballs, ram attacks, and tail swipes. Many players seem to be under the impression that Ridley will only leave once he damages you enough, but this is actually one of the two outcomes. If you keep dodging his attacks and deal enough damage, Ridley will be defeated. Only if you win the fight, you'll see Ridley accidentally drop the Metroid before he scrambles to escape. I always feel so cool when I slap Ridley around and scare him away. This is such a fantastic way of utilizing the interactive potential of these kinds of gameplay story scenes. Ridley will escape regardless of which outcome you get, but I think it's so great that this intro is varied based on your performance in this fight. It is unfortunate that this is the only instance of something like this in the entire series, but after you scare Ridley off, he initiates a self-destruct sequence of the series station. He's stolen the Metroid that nobody knows about, and he intends to leave no trace that he was ever there. In the first Metroid, the Galactic Federation at least had the benefit of knowing that the space pirates stole a Metroid. If Ridley gets away with this Metroid, however, the Federation will be completely blindsided. As far as the Federation knows, the Metroids are likely all gone. So Samus makes her desperate escape not only to save her own life, but also to put a stop to Ridley's plans. The series colony is a straight simple line with some basic platforming, so escaping isn't difficult. Even the steam doesn't actually do any damage, because this is just the intro after all. All within a few minutes, Super Metroid manages to throw a lot of information at you through its, at the time, high production value cutscene and its interactive introduction. Somehow, Super Metroid found a way to make exposition dumping and tutorialization fun and seamless. My only criticism of this introduction is, of course, that the lengthy cutscene cannot be skipped. Replaying this game, 
already knowing the story, it's kind of lame having to sit through both recaps and the events leading to Ciri's station. I also feel like the game could be more clear about the fact that Samus is trekking really back to Zebus, because all the cutscene really shows is just that Samus goes back to Zebus after series. Especially if you don't know what Zebus even is, then this might be just a bit confusing. Those small issues aside, this opening effectively lays out the story premise and tutorializes the game mechanics. It does all of this while maintaining immersion through its interactivity. Super Metroid's visuals have aged incredibly well. Sprite art is phenomenal, and the use of color is striking. Every little creature is drawn with care, and despite its more pixelated look, Super Metroid's graphical presentation manages to age incredibly well because of its strong art direction. Yes, you can still make out individual pixels, but there is so much care put into the way this game looks. The hardware allows for proper shading, and sprites like Samus are large, affording plenty of detail. Super Metroid came out fairly late into the Super Nintendo's life, and you can tell that the developer developers had a strong grasp on their hardware. Directly comparing the animations of a 16-bit, sprite-based game to a modern, high-definition 3D game is obviously not going to play Super in a favorable light. But despite this, Super manages to hold up overall. Super evolves the deep blackness of the backgrounds of the first two games into something more suitable for this more advanced hardware. Vibrant foreground objects cascade into blackness in a way that really makes the foregrounds pop. Backgrounds not only finally even exist, but they combine closer foreground objects with blackness to make the rooms feel vast. Other backgrounds use darker textures and are drawn to make the walls feel close. This claustrophobic feeling further adds variation between the rooms, and works fantastically to visualize the world as a proper location. Admittedly, there are some backgrounds that feel merely serviceable, flat, and perhaps forgettable. These more forgettable ones tend to repeat more abstract patterns without much else going on. Expectedly, Super Metroid looks great and has aged well, but it's not the best looking Metroid game in the series. That's to be expected considering the hardware, but it's still impressive that this game's visuals have aged as well as they have. Other backgrounds, like this one in Meridia, seem more abstract than anything. Despite how much it clashes with the more believable parts of the world, I can't help but like this especially strange background for how unique it is. Are these things floating in the water? What even are they? In Super Metroid in particular, far more than any other Metroid game, there are a lot of parts of the environments that just feel like they are impossible to understand or make sense of. This might sound like a criticism, but it's actually a compliment to the game world. So much of Zebus is beyond what anyone can fully understand. There's just so much here that feels very otherworldly and strange. This is an alien planet after all, so it fits the atmosphere that the game is going for perfectly. Zebus, this time around, consists of six-ish levels. Criteria, the surface, is a drab, rainy landscape. The surface of the planet feels desolate and empty. Only moss really seems to thrive here. Brinstar is now an expansive and varied cave system with Chozo settlement remains, and several aesthetics within this single level. Pink Brinstar is full of petals that fall from the plants on the ceiling in these winding caves. In Green Brinstar, you'll find moss, twisting thorny vines, and many colorful kinds of plants. Some of these plants even appear to have some kind of teeth growing inside. Glowing blue lichen appear along the walls. Just a little further, Red Brinstar features alien-made stone carvings and lots of scaffolding decorating the backgrounds. These dead shrubs hint that the Chozo that once cared for these plants are long gone. Neatly placed red bricks line the walls, but just upstairs the aesthetic shifts completely to bizarre plant-like growths coating nearly every surface. Jagged teeth-like spikes line the floors, and these strange mouths attempt to swallow whatever falls in. It's unclear if these bizarre creatures were always here, or if they grew after after the disappearance of the Chozo. I kind of like that we don't know, but regardless, their appearance is so freaky and perfectly Metroid. All of these different aesthetics exist within one level. Brinstar is certainly the most varied level by far, but Super Metroid still manages to offer an impressive variety throughout each of its levels as well. There are many little details to observe in the different rooms of this game. The key hunters have eggs on the ceiling in this room. There's this dead guy outside of Kraid's lair. There appears to be droppings underneath these shriek bats. Samus's visor turns yellow when she's using night vision in dark rooms. Samus has a breathing animation. Little bugs scurry away on your first visit to Crateria and Old Turian. The list goes on and on. 
All of these little details of Zebus come together to give the world a fleshed out history. Aesthetics are strong in Super Metroid not just because of the art, but also the tremendous care placed into making this world feel memorable. Super Metroid is also continuing to employ its design philosophy of using the game world itself to convey tutorials and the story in addition to the more familiar ways of characterizing its world. Criteria starts off as a straight path with numerous dead ends immediately visible. These dead ends are made obvious right away to ease the player into the world design's concepts of item contingent progression. This is to teach the player that backtracking to older areas with new items will reveal hidden pathways, as the player will soon be returning here with the morph ball and missiles. Just nearby, you can find the familiar blue stone caves of the first game's Brinstar. You actually revisit the exact location you started in in the first game. You start in the escape shaft from the first game and drop in backwards from where Samus once faced Mother Brain. This is another aspect of Super Metroid that sets it apart from the other games. Super Metroid is keenly aware of its status as a sequel, and it manages to recontextualize your familiarity into something else. These moments of familiarity are used to unsettle you. Your bombastic journey of the first game has left Brinstar desolate and empty. The barren landscape shown to you when you first land almost makes it feel like this area has largely remained untouched since your first visit here. The only sign of life is a sudden loud and bright eyeball camera spotting you. It doesn't harm you, but it follows your movement through the room. A security camera is an odd thing to see, a clear sign of something intelligent watching you, but your only choice is to keep moving. Returning to leave, you'll be ambushed by these space pirate troopers. It turns out that they're the ones behind the camera. Grey doors are a new concept to Super Metroid, and they are wordlessly communicated to the player in this moment. Players will eventually figure out on their own that defeating every enemy in a room unlocks the doors. These grey space pirates die in just a single shot because, again, the game has only just started. The scenario feels more threatening than it actually is to engage and encourage the player. There are a lot of small platforms in this room and in the next room, and this is part of why placing the revisit to Turian so early in the game was such a great choice. Players are forced to practice their platforming here and become skilled enough to jump their way to the top. Players are learning about aiming different directions to hit the wall-crawling space pirates as well. The game wants you to feel prepared for the more challenging segments by forcing you through this more linear beginning. Much of the game world is characterized not only through the environments, but also from the interactive story moments like this. One side effect of Super Metroid's commitment to telling its story through interactive scenes without any dialogue is that many of the scenes leave a lot to interpretation. Take this scene here in Turian, where the Super Metroid decides not to kill Samus and flees the scene. The common interpretation is that this Metroid recognizes Samus as its mother, but some interpret that the Metroid is intelligent enough to recognize the fact that it was spared by Samus and thus decides to spare Samus in return. The specifics on the relationship between the larva and Samus are not explicitly stated, so the motives of the Super Metroid are uncertain. Many finer details in the 2D Metroid games are committed to this minimalistic style. A huge appeal of this minimalistic style is that players are left to draw their own conclusions and theories about the finer details of not only the story, but also the game world. I've already gone over much of this in my previous videos as well, but Metroid as a series so far has centered its entire identity around this design philosophy. There are no dialogue boxes, cinematic cutscenes are only just introduced and kept to a minimum here, there is no scan visor, no NPCs, none of this stuff is found in Super. Those other kinds of storytelling methods also have their place in this series, and they too have found outstanding success in creating a compelling experience. But sometimes, less is more. Even in the modern era, minimalism enjoys its own unique advantages over other storytelling methods, not the least of which is a profound feeling of lasting intrigue. Zebus is wordlessly characterized through design aspects like its visuals and sound, but the gameplay also synergizes with these elements to further enhance the experience of the game world. Button mapping is here, and this is huge for obvious reasons. Allowing the player to customize the controls for themselves should be an industry standard across all games. Every game needs button mapping, and it's absolutely fantastic that it's here in Super Metroid. Players make all different kinds of control schemes to suit their preferences, and I absolutely must place emphasis on the importance of this particular feature. Super Metroid is the only official Metroid game to do this from an in-game menu, and this inclusion deserves tremendous appreciation. Super Metroid takes much from its predecessors when it comes to control. 
the spin jump is back, as are your other moves like crouching and aiming downwards. Not much new to say about these moves, but they're just as great as they were in Metroid 2. Midair Morph Ball is introduced, as is being able to aim diagonally. Midair Morph allows for executing on tight movement to reach difficult areas or take advantage of niche movement tech to save time. There's something really satisfying about saving time from jumping near a hole and landing inside as a Morph Ball. Diagonal aiming is a literal game changer. What can I even say about diagonal aiming? Aiming is so much better with additional options in Metroid, and it feels so good to position Samus and her aiming to a variety of scenarios. Especially since so many of Samus's bosses are large creatures, diagonal aiming is useful for aiming your shots to deal damage from a relatively safe position. Super Metroid is built around Samus having these new moves, so it doesn't feel like it breaks the game at all. It just makes the movement and combat more diverse and interesting. Another notable new feature is the Run button, which offers dynamic momentum and allows Samus to perform different running jumps. Samus's general moveset is evolved, but platforming in particular is even further expanded from the inclusion of a Run button. It feels great to reach high ledges and clear large gaps from getting a running start. There's an extra element of assessing the level design to utilize your new jumping capability. The run does open opportunities for advanced jumping, but honestly, the level design doesn't often offer much of any chances to actually use this move to do anything terribly interesting. This move is only occasionally useful, which just further makes it largely situational. I don't see the run button as this big game changer that many describe. I see it as a situational tool with several drawbacks. Instead of telling you how to run, the game uses what has widely become known as the Noob Bridge players pass through a one-way gate that forces them to proceed forward. You cannot falsely conclude that you've hit a dead end. In order to cross the bridge, you must be running. So you're forced to learn to run or join the ranks of the countless people that have given up and asked the internet. I appreciate Super Metroid's wordless tutorialization, but I think it would have been better if the game had some unobtrusive text or maybe an icon appear to tell you how to run. I might have preferred something like how Metroid Prime does it, and it would only appear if you fail the bridge a few times. For what it's worth, the run feature is mentioned in the game manual and the button mapping menu, but considering just how many people get stuck here, the game may have benefited from just putting this in the game itself somehow. Another small issue that I have with the run button is that there is no always run option in the settings. Give me the option to turn the run button into a walk button and everyone is satisfied. As it is, I'm holding the run button down so often that I can't help but feel like the run button was not a worthwhile inclusion as it is, at least for me personally. Having to constantly jump and shoot while also holding the run button feels cumbersome having my one thumb doing so much at one time. I have that general issue with basically every game with an infinite stamina run button that doesn't include the option to always run. But anyways, the run button is hardly the contentious topic when it comes to Super Metroid's controls. There are many ongoing conversations online about Super's jumping physics. Many avid defenders and equally passionate detractors go back and forth about this one. Honestly, I'm not immediately sure about where I stand on Super's jumping physics. I often hear the words clunky, dated, and floaty used to describe this jump. I can say that I prefer any of the jumping controls of the future 2D releases, but I'm unsure if I'd go so far as to say that Super Metroid's jump is bad for what it is. Samus seems to ascend very quickly, but her falling speed is much slower. Her vertical acceleration is much greater than her horizontal acceleration unless you get a tremendous running start. I think this particular discrepancy in the vertical and horizontal acceleration is where I might take issue. I wish I didn't have to run so much just to get any decent horizontal distance distance, and I wish I didn't have to go so high in the sky just to cover any decent distance. I also don't feel like I need that much time in the air, so maybe the falling speed could be increased a bit. I'm unsure about this one, but I do know that I prefer the jumping physics in any of the sequel games. Super's jumping isn't bad, but I honestly can totally understand why someone might feel that way. One big thing that bothers me about the jumping is something rather irritating about the spin jump. Only in Super Metroid, the slightest input on D-pad up or down will instantly cancel a spin jump to make Samus aim. This is one of my greatest complaints about Super's controls, and it's interesting to me that I seem to be the only one much more concerned about this over the actual physics of the jump. I absolutely hate it when I'm trying to do a wall jump or use the space jump and I'm forced to go plummeting to the ground because I so much as thought about the d-pad up a little too hard. Samus will cancel her spin jump to take aim, and then sink like a rock every time you press up or down even slightly. Once again, a cancelled spin jump 
frustratingly, cannot be reinitiated until you hit the ground. This bothers me so much more than it probably should, but I've never heard anyone complain about this, so maybe it's just me. I've had this issue bother me more and less across different consoles and controllers that I choose to use. Initiating the spin jump is also oddly picky because you can't just hold left or right and then press jump. There's a slight delay between when you start moving and when the game actually lets you spin jump, and this makes spin jumping occasionally more complicated than it needs to be. It seems that you can't spin jump at all if you try to do it against a wall you're standing next to. And since I mentioned the space jump earlier, I'll again criticize the space jump for feeling oddly picky about when it decides to work. Like Metroid 2, it's easy to fail its weirdly picky timing and sink like a rock until you hit the ground. Regardless of where you stand on Super Metroid's jumping or running controls, I think most can agree that Super Metroid's item selection controls are not ideal. In Metroid 1 and 2, pressing the select button would toggle missiles on and off. It was simple and intuitive. Super Metroid now makes the select button toggle between up to five different abilities in a menu. If I want to use the third item in this menu, I have to press the selection button three times. Then if I want to switch to, say, the second item, I have to either press the item select the exact number of times to cycle through, or press a separate item cancel button and then press the item select twice. This is way more complicated than it needs to be. It's not terrible, but it's certainly not ideal for when I'm in the middle of a fight and I need to quickly alternate between my different attacks. Regardless of where you decide to map the two item selection buttons, having to navigate a menu in real time with a selection and cancel button feels clunky. Super's momentum doesn't offer that much to the casual player, but there's a certain je ne sais quoi with the advanced techniques that is absolutely unique to Super. Super is odd in that it simultaneously offers a lot of advanced techniques, but it also just kind of feels sluggish and clunky a lot of the time. Feels like this control scheme is better in some ways, but also worse in other ways. I know that some players will die on the hill that Super's controls are the best in the series, and I know others that can't stand playing this game because they think the controls are just that awful. I'm caught somewhere in between on the topic of Super's controls overall. There are things that bother me, but there are also things that I appreciate about it that remain unique to this day. Super Metroid's music is more similar to Metroid 1 than it is Metroid 2. There is a blend of catchy melodies and a haunting atmosphere. The music usually is meant to represent the individual levels, but there are also a number of tracks for specific story moments as well. Metroid's music, like its art, straddles a line between droning horror and a heroic and uplifting tone. The world and music are both simultaneously inviting and menacing. Super Metroid uses the higher fidelity of the Super Nintendo to mimic real-life instruments, also using electronic-sounding synths that sound appropriately Metroid. This game has so many tracks that I won't be going over all of them for the sake of pacing this video appropriately. Starting with the title screen, we are given a more explicit aura of horror, with these breathing pads accompanying the main theme. Since Planet Zebus starts off quiet and mysterious, we're given ambient droning and an ominous chorus to set the mood. chorus irregularly cuts in and out as though it's distant, further supporting the vaguely menacing atmosphere of this introduction to Planet Zevis. Once the pirates ambush you, we are given this track with these drums that represent the more immediate and overt menacing aura of the pirates. Star is the end of the more ambient introduction to Zeppus, marking the beginning of the adventure proper. The 
the track reflects this with its focus on melody and upbeat tone. The more ambient choir in the track maintains an air of mystery. This is to remind the player that though tension of the pirate encounters is over, the world is still largely unknown and dangerous. Red Brinstar's background pulses as though it were a living organism, and this is paralleled by the music of the area. This particular track is a fan favorite, and I can easily understand why. There's a distinct emotional appeal in the melody and choir that makes this entire area especially distinct and memorable. The drums and choir of Norfair feel harsh, drawing parallels to the claustrophobic heat of this level. This track places focus back on the atmosphere, but maintains a feeling of unconcealed danger. This contrasts against Meridia's more vague, droning instrumentation. Despite feeling more faint than Norfair, the air of danger is just as prevalent. Meridia's flute feels dreadful in the best way. There's a certain irregularity to the music of the wrecked ship that complements the horrendous feeling of this area. There is a commitment to connecting the music specifically to the levels, which enriches the environments through the instrumentation and melody. There are plenty of other tracks to go over, but I'd like to keep things moving, and instead move on to discuss the more story-focused tracks. For encounters like the bosses, there are actually only a handful of boss tracks for all of the encounters. The first is what would eventually become Ridley's theme. For what it is, this theme is appropriately blood pumping and raises the tension of the encounters. Because this theme would become so iconic and be remixed so many times, I can't help but feel underwhelmed by the way it sounds here. It's not nearly as high energy or layered as any of its other renditions, and that's just an unfortunate consequence of it being the first version on 16-bit hardware. To go on a bit of a tangent, many of Super Metroid's tracks have been remixed into future releases, even some having multiple remixes. I can't help but find many of the tracks in Super Metroid to be the least good versions of each of these tracks. It's understandable that the 16-bit first versions would be the least good ones, but even so, I can't help but find many of Super's tracks to feel kind of underwhelming. It's very telling that these tracks were so good that they got remixed in the first place, but tracks like Lower Norfair, Red Soil Brinstar, Ridley's Theme, and the Theme of Samus Aran are all my least favorite versions of these tracks. Back to the Ridley theme in particular, another thing that irks me about this track is just how often it is used. This theme is played during the Ridley encounter on series, the series escape music, during the Torizo boss fight, during the second Torizo boss fight, during Dragon, during the Ridley fight, and during the final escape. Even if this is only because of cartridge limitations, it's not something I'm interested in excusing. If it's repetitive, then it's repetitive. The other boss track, the track that would come to be known as Kraid's theme, isn't repeated as often. It's a great track for Kraid, since I think it captures his colossal size, but it never quite felt right for Fantoon. Other story-related tracks include some moments of dread, like this track that plays before certain moments to build tension. The player has come to expect that the music is connected directly to the environments, so these moments that break that expectation can be exceptionally unnerving. The last track that I'll choose to discuss is the one that plays during the final boss, the theme of Mother Brain.
there are many tracks that are widely appreciated and celebrated by members of the community, and I've noticed that from my personal experience, I never really hear anyone talk about this track in particular. I think that's a tremendous shame, since this is one of my favorite tracks in the entire series. It so perfectly captures the overwhelming presence of Mother Brain's terrifying new body, being trapped with this otherworldly terror. Seriously one of the best boss music tracks I've ever heard in a game, and one of my favorite tracks in video games, period. The higher sound quality of the Super Nintendo has provided Super Metroid's developers an opportunity to give Metroid its own identity, not only through the music, but also through the sound effects. Sound effects demonstrate a commitment to in-universe believability. Super Metroid sounds are all diegetic, though I'm not sure about the health and ammo pickup sounds. Either way, I can't place how I would describe these sounds. I can say with certainty that I think they absolutely nailed this feeling of believability while also giving the game a distinct Metroid personality. The fanfares return in new renditions, which sound nice. The expansion pickup fanfare is unfortunately absent from this game. Every single pickup will give you the full fanfare, and especially since there are so many more expansions, the fanfare has never before or since felt so repetitive as it does here. <laughs> One thing that does feel rather aged about Super Metroid Sound is that this game uses certain sounds repeatedly in such a way where it feels distracting. You can tell they were doing the best with what they had to convey the idea of continuous screaming, but it's a part of this game that feels like it hasn't aged well. Of course, I don't blame the developers for this, as this was the best that they could have done with the hardware. An expected outcome of going for a sense of realism on the Super Nintendo. Even after the criticisms I've offered, I still am largely positive on Super Metroid's music and sound effects. The fact that it's aged as well as it has is a compliment to the achievements of this game. Super's Zebus is an incredible showing of the potential of a Metroid game's world design. Zebus is complex, sprawling, and very interconnected. The complexity of the world layout is far beyond anything seen in either of the first two games, and remains as one of the most sprawling and intertwined maps in the entire series. Zebus is made of six-ish main levels, and all but one of them are interconnected in a vague, ring-like shape. Norfair is the outlier, as it is only connected to Brinstar. This one elevator is placed in close proximity to direct pathways to Criteria and Meridia, and the way to Criteria places you just outside of the wrecked ship. The red part of Brinstar acts as somewhat of a superhighway to interconnect nearly everything together. Super Metroid also places many elevators around the world that connect the different levels together in multiple locations. Shortcuts in general are far more common than they ever have been. Super Metroid respects the player's time by introducing new areas and power-ups to the player at an appropriate pace. One such example is the part of the world where you get to the grappling beam. You went all the way down this path to get here, and the designers could have just made you travel all the way back to return to the rest of the map. Backtracking is common in Super Metroid, but the game doesn't like to throw backtracking at you for no reason. A straight shot like this wouldn't offer much if you had to immediately do the entire thing backwards. There is a path of grappling beam blocks that leads you from the grappling beam all the way out of Norfair and back to Red Brinstar, where you can use your other new items, High Jump and Ice Beam, to place you right where you need to be. The world offers this fresh route back through Norfair instead of just making you backtrack for backtracking's sake. Backtracking is intuitively diversified through the synergy between the item progression and the world design. Within each level, every dead end has something useful like a map station, recharge station, expansion, or a save room. Many pathways start off as dead ends due to the player lacking specific progression items, but the explorable area gradually opens as you collect more and more. The design philosophy of the first game's world has evolved to new heights. There are so many more pathways, so much more interconnection, and so much more to see. Just compare their maps directly, and it immediately becomes clear just how much more is going on in Super Metroid. Increasing the complexity of the world means that there is more focus on navigation, exploration, and progression. There is a loose linearity in the structure of your progression through this world in that nearly everyone is going to start in Criteria, go to Brinstar, then Norfair, then the wrecked ship, 
then Meridia, and finally Turian. There is certainly plenty of in-between and backtracking, but this loosely linear structure does offer its own benefits, such as some kind of difficulty curve. The world design of Super Metroid is one of the game's greatest strengths for its commitment to balancing the non-linear and linear aspects of its design, playing to the strengths of both philosophies with outstanding success. To explain how, I'll need to move on to explain the other design aspects that inform this gameplay loop. Super Metroid's progression is widely known for defining what would become the Metroidvania genre. As I went over in the previous videos, this was present in the first two games, but it's Super Metroid that would make this kind of item contingent progression a priority. I would even go so far as to say that the item progression is so huge that it's kind of the main point of the entire game. From Planetfall to nearly the very end, exploration is contingent on your item roster. In Metroid 1 or 2, you'd only need like 3 or 4 items before the entire world was open to you. Like 30 minutes into Metroid NES and and as early as the beginning of Area 3 in Metroid 2, item contingent progression is already left behind. Super Metroid, however, places focus on item progression for the vast majority of the game. Many new items are added, like super missiles, power bombs, speed booster, gravity suit, and grappling beam. Each of these items have specific applications that open your progression opportunities once the item is acquired. Additionally, many returning items are given new explorative utilization, like wave beam now being able to shoot through these one-way gates, or the various suit now protecting Samus from extreme heat. This is where I believe the power-ups of the Metroid series are finally given a new layer of depth that fully realizes them as multifaceted tools. The best kinds of power-ups in Metroid have both exploratory and combative or traversal applications. The same power-up that opens green doors is also useful for destroying powerful enemies, or the power-up that is used to jump over enemies is also used to ascend to new heights. Nearly every power-up in Super Metroid serves a variety of uses, and this makes every power-up far more interesting than they otherwise would be. Many new items add an extra layer of depth to the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, such as the new speed booster. Speed booster destroys these arrow blocks, sure, but this this also massively further enhances your jump if you get a running start. Speed Booster can also destroy other destructible tiles and enemies instantly just by running through them, and rewards the player that is able to maintain an uninterrupted charge. This move is so satisfying to use because it opens a whole new opportunity for players to demonstrate their skill. Other new abilities like the X-Ray Scope and Power Bombs act as useful tools for revealing hidden pathways, reducing the chances of players getting stuck. These save so much time and are just intrinsically fun to use because of their visual and sound design as well. It's fun to become suspicious of a specific room and physically scan a room with a special visor. One small thing that bothers me about the power bombs is that they do not reveal false tiles like they do in Zero Mission. That little extra bit of usefulness absent is a missed opportunity. The power-ups in Super Metroid enhance the gameplay not only through their fun factor, but also through their mechanical design. This is done so well that it feels like placing so much focus on them was the perfect choice. To get into more detail about the item progression, I'd like to first summarize Super Metroid's progression through Planet Zebus from start to finish. Like any other Metroid game, the explorable area starts off small. At the very start, there are so many dead ends that you're almost certain to find the Morph Ball in just a few minutes. Collecting the Morph Ball opens a few new areas, and Missiles open a few more. Missiles are so close that you're almost certain to quickly find them. Again, pathing options are so limited and bombs are so close that you'll find them in a short matter of time. Once obtained, bombs open a convenient nearby pathway to Brinstar. Just before reaching Brinstar, you can find a statue room of the four main bosses of the world. These four bosses represent the event progression tasks of Super Metroid, as all four must be defeated to access the final level. They're not too important this early on. Back to Brinstar, Brinstar has many pathways, but you won't actually be able to go anywhere until you obtain the super missiles. It's more expansive than Criteria, but the many pathways of this segment of Brinstar shouldn't take you very long to explore. Once super missiles are obtained, the way forward is again very close and fairly obvious. Passing through this one-way gate and dropping you down the shaft will lock you into the lower part of Brinstar near Norfair. The older areas of the map are temporarily inaccessible. You are stuck in a smaller area until you obtain the high jump boots to reach Kraid, which requires you to dip into Norfair. Like the beginning of the game, most pathways are inaccessible because you don't have the required items. The only pathway that doesn't quickly end is the way to high jump. The high jump does not afford exploratory benefit in any of the pathways in Norfair, so players are forced to conclude that the way forward is back in Brinstar. You 
are restricted to these small segments in Brinstar and Norfair, so it's only a matter of time before the player notices that their hopefully downloaded map indicates the presence of a secret room on the other side of this wall. Follow this path for a few secret tiles along a straight shot, and you're led right to the Varia suit. Varia opens up a lot of Norfair, so there's a good stretch of exploration gameplay here. Of the many paths available to you, the only progression item that you can actually reach is the speed booster. This opens the way to the ice beam back at the beginning of Norfair, which allows you to freeze the rippers to climb back up that tower in Brinstar. This unlocks a path that loops back to the previously inaccessible rest of the world, which opens the world back up. Climbing this tower also leads you to the power bombs towards the top. Just before heading this way, you were deliberately shown these power bomb blocks on your way to the ice beam. So even though you now have the whole world available to you, the only way to make progress is back here at the beginning of Norfair, and they should be fresh in your mind. You must return to these power bomb tiles to explore a new chunk of the level to face Krokomire and obtain the grappling beam. The grapple beam allows you to grab the optional wave beam on the other side of Norfair, eliminating those blue one-way gates. In addition to its combative benefits, opening these gates offers navigational benefits as well. Grapple Beam also lets you cross this gap back in Criteria to reach the wrecked ship. As went over previously, there is a deliberate placement of grapple swing tiles and freezable rippers to lead you right to the wrecked ship. Between obtaining the ice beam and entering the wrecked ship, it's possible and even likely that the player would get lost and possibly backtrack through older areas. This is a good chance to collect many expansions and optional goodies like Spacer or the many missile tanks. Eventually, the player should overcome the navigational challenge and find their way inside the wrecked ship. Once you can get inside of the wrecked ship, the entire area itself is self-contained. You won't need to leave this area until after it's completely finished. The entire wrecked ship is available to you once you defeat the area boss, and one of those paths will lead to the gravity suit. Instead of placing the boss at the end of the area, the wrecked ship places Fantoon at the beginning. The ship isn't very large, so it shouldn't take too long to find the gravity suit. The gravity suit allows you to move freely through water, which allows the player to access this convenient nearby elevator to Meridia, or or travel to Lower Brinstar and jump through the water to reach Meridia that way. There are two correct pathways here to increase the likelihood that the player will find their way forward. Nearly all of Meridia is available to you from the outset, and Meridia is entirely self-contained. You won't need to go to any earlier areas to make progress until you're completely finished with this level. Meridia is large and twisted with many secrets. Despite the fact that there is only a single progression item at the very end, this level is still likely to give you some trouble through its confusing layout and challenging navigation. Defeating Meridia's area boss grants you the space jump, which allows you to ascend infinitely and gain access to lower Norfair. This is perhaps the greatest navigational challenge of the game, as the entire world is open to you at this point. It's up to you to explore the whole world until you find this pathway in Norfair. The game does place this memorable looking Ridley statue here, so players that discover this are likely to have this area stick out in their mind. But if you never made it beyond this power bomb door, then the area is completely forgettable. This is a big reason why labeling doors on the map is so important. The game also does not tell you that the gravity suit makes you immune to this lava, which it really should. Finding your way to Ridley's lair could have been handled better than this. There's very high potential to get stuck here for multiple reasons, but once the player finally finds their way, you may enter Lower Norfair. Once again, this segment of the map is self-contained. There aren't any more progression items, but that previously mentioned boss statue indicates that Ridley is the last boss remaining and must be destroyed to access the final level. The final level is, once again, completely self-contained and can be completed in its entirety upon entering. It's almost a straight shot and features no item progression. So Super Metroid's focus on item progression is so great that it ends up being the main point of the game. It's an adventure maze game wherein your navigational skills are put to the test. You must assess the item logic and experiment with your arsenal to account for your explorable area. Where you can go is constantly expanding, but the actual path through the world is deceivingly linear. One design challenge that every Metroidvania game must face is balancing your ever-expanding game world with respecting the player's time. Since your explorable area gets bigger and bigger, keeping track of everything can become unreasonable and exhausting, like finding needles in a haystack. Super Metroid addresses this potential issue by making the last four levels of the game all entirely self-contained. Like Metroid 2, this means that the player can reset their cognitive load as they progress to each new level in the game's second half. 
though item progression is still present, it's also worth mentioning that these self-contained levels only place progression items at the very end to unlock the next level, such as with the gravity suit and the space jump. The focus on item progression teeters off in Super Metroid's second half, but even so, this is still a tremendous focus of this game. Super Metroid's world slowly becomes more open as the game continues, and the game employs tricks like the one-way gates to restrict the explorable area available. Right as that one-way gate is able to be bypassed, the game suddenly places a focus on a level progression style more similar to that of Metroid 2. It may not initially seem to be the case, but Super Metroid's world design and progression are working together to guide the player down a specific path. This certainly offers the potential to help prevent the player from getting lost, but it's entirely possible that a player may falsely conclude that they've hit a dead end in one of these self-contained levels. If a player decides to backtrack out of one of these levels before the level is finished, they're likely to waste a lot of time in older levels that only offer optional items like expansions. Thinking they need to backtrack to find a specific progression item that doesn't actually exist. The game has its moments of more cryptic progression, such as with finding Lower Norfair, but even so, I still largely appreciate all of what Super Metroid is able to accomplish. The item progression of Super Metroid is laid out in that there is a clear sequence of the intended progression item ordering. There is a defined point A to B to C from start to finish. For example, players cannot reach the Varia suit without first getting the high jump. Of course, this outlined intended sequence of progression can be broken with Super Metroid's hidden moves. It's no secret that Super Metroid allows you to break the sequence of the intended item order. There are two pathways in Brinstar where it's easy to find yourself stuck in an area with some strange animals. If you use your speed booster to round down this hallway, which has a specific layout place to encourage you to do this, then you'll accidentally destroy this bridge and fall down a long shaft. This creature at the bottom will then proceed to demonstrate a specific move to you. I remember accidentally falling down this path for the first time and being vaguely familiar with Super Metroid having secret moves, but it was really exciting for the game to wordlessly teach me about one of these moves like this. I ran back and forth and watched the creature carefully. I didn't quite get it until I noticed that the creature was crouching and all of a sudden I was able to do this. This is called the Shine Spark. The Shine Spark is a move that allows you to zip in one direction at ultra high speed, but it can only be done if you have enough space to charge up up by storing a speed boost. This move destroys certain types of destructible blocks and most creatures, but of course it also allows you to reach otherwise inaccessible areas. Take this pit of water just outside of the wrecked ship. You're supposed to come back later with the grappling beam to get across, but you can come here early and use the shine spark to cross instead. Maybe you want this energy tank near Krokomire early, or this powerbomb tank near the landing site without space jump. Shine sparking also just further enhances the general application of the speed booster, like using it to zip through rooms that are supposed to take more time. Shine sparking is so much of a game changer, not just because flying around at super speed is a fun spectacle, but also because it further diversifies the moveset mechanics and expands the sequence breaking potential. As fantastic as the speed booster is, I think this is unfortunately the worst or second worst, version of it that we've ever had in a Metroid game. First, the controls are far too picky for just trying to pick a direction to aim your shine spark. The timing required of you pressing the direction and the jump button are both so oddly specific that even all these years later I cannot consistently shine spark sideways. Every other Metroid game with shine spark I can consistently and intuitively shine spark any direction I want. Here in Super Metroid, sideways shine sparking is so demanding that I don't even want to bother trying it a lot of the time. Other directions are perfectly fine, but specifically straight left or right is ridiculous. Second, shine sparking in this game hurts you. This isn't a big deal to me personally, but I'm glad that it's not something they ever thought to revisit. Lastly, and most importantly, there just isn't that much of any opportunity to utilize this move, at least relative to the other Metroid games. It's outright required for like three items, it's useful in one sequence break, and it's useful for a handful of early expansions. But otherwise, there's just not that much of any interesting utilization of this move. Future releases offer many interesting shine sparking challenges, and there just aren't really any of those complex and creative challenges here in Super. Shine sparking into a diagonal surface does not maintain your speed booster, you cannot shine spark in the morph ball, and you cannot perform a wall jumping speed boost to use your shine spark in new ways. Super's shine spark doesn't offer as much variety or creative use in unique challenges like it would in other games, and it just feels like there's not enough going on with it here to keep me interested for very long. This isn't so much of an issue with Super Metroid itself, but rather just an area in which the sequel games 
build on what Super established. Compared to those games, I can't help but find Super's speed booster and shine sparking opportunities lacking. Overall, however, and taken on its own merits, it's still a fantastic addition to Samus's moveset that adds variation to the moment to moment gameplay and expands sequence breaking. For as great of an addition as shine sparking is, I can't help but think that it's nothing compared to Super Metroid's other new secret move. If you decide to powerbomb this floor in Brinstar's entrance, which clearly indicates that it goes somewhere, you'll follow a one way path that leads to a save state. Saving here means that you cannot escape until you learn the hidden move that allows you to climb this shaft. These three goofy little fellas will do their little choreographed song and dance, but then they will begin to wall jump back and forth to climb the shaft. Once they make it to the top, they drop right back down to show you again. When I found this room for the very first time, it took me a lot longer to finally figure it out. I was struggling with getting the timing right, and the actual animation of the little aliens doesn't tell you that much about how to actually perform the move. I was under the impression that I needed to jump away from the wall as soon as I made contact with it, because that's how it was in Super Mario 64. But the truth of the matter is that you must spin jump towards a wall, and you can be near the wall for as little or as long as you want. As long as Samus is spinning near a wall, you must then press the direction opposite of the wall. Samus will briefly change her pose to this sprite here. When you see that Samus is in this specific animation, you must press jump and keep holding the opposite direction of the wall you're jumping away from. Once you know exactly how to do it, wall jumping is pretty easy. However, the wall jumping controls are, unfortunately, not ideal in my opinion. I think myself and many others have found ourselves confused because we didn't know to watch for any kind of visual cue. The big thing that really hurts while jumping is my previous complaint about the slightest input on up or down instantly cancelling your spin jump. Combine that with being unable to reinitiate a spin jump until you've hit the floor, and it's all too easy to accidentally take aim when you're just trying to wall jump. Super Metroid's very sensitive D-pad means that it's super easy to fall out of a wall jump and have no choice but to sink like a rock all the way down to the ground. Just because myself and many others are able to get used to these controls, I don't think that excuses this design. Super Metroid's wall jump is notable for being one of the few games that allows you to perform single wall scaling, which massively opens the opportunity for where you can perform this trick to sequence break. Wall jumping is celebrated for similar reasons to shine sparking, but wall jumping has a much greater impact overall. Even your basic platforming is diversified through wall jumping, as you can use it to take tighter jumps, save time, and of course reach new heights. Integrating this move into your basic moveset makes for more satisfying platforming. The sequence breaking potential of wall jumping is so massive that it's difficult to name off all of the different ways you can break the sequence. Countless expansions are able to be collected early through wall jumping. You can get early wave beam, early spazer, early power bombs, early various suit, and much more. You can even outright skip many items just by deciding to wall jump to bypass many items like high jump or grapple beam. Wall jumping completely breaks the item progression sequence wide open. It's so satisfying going around the world and experimenting with your hidden moves to see what you can do and where you can go. Experimentation and exploration have evolved in Super Metroid so much that it's a huge reason why so many people continue to play and talk about this game. One returning trick from Return of Samus is the infinite bomb jump. This trick is great to have, but unfortunately it's somewhat super annuated by the wall jump and shine spark. You can still use it to ascend infinitely, but the only advantage that it has over the other two tricks is that you can still do it without any walls and you don't need the speed booster, nor any kind of running start. The unfortunate thing is that this is quite the big if, as the only scenario that I can think of where this might be useful is if you want to reach this specific energy tank and two missile tanks before you get the speed booster. Beyond that particular scenario, I'm having trouble thinking of any reason for me to ever use IBJs. One last trick that I'd like to discuss is the not-so-intuitive trick called the Mock Ball. To perform a Mock Ball, you must get a running start and enter the Morph Ball right as you're about to hit the ground. If done correctly, you can maintain full running speed while in the Morph Ball. This trick can be used to bypass speed booster gates and reach items like Ice Beam and Super Missiles early. Like I said in my video about Metroid NES, these types of sequence breaks may not offer the same kind of intuitive experimentation as something like the Shine Spark, but these are a huge part of Super Metroid's speedrunning culture and are still tremendously satisfying to pull off. You're going to be following an online guide more than figuring this out yourself, but that doesn't mean that it can't be fun to learn this trick and master something like early super missiles. There are many counterintuitive tricks like this that even further expand the sequence breaking opportunities of super. I don't mean to downplay the importance of these tricks, but they are beyond the scope of this video. 
All of these tricks shake the Metroid formula to its core, and completely redefine what a Metroid game could be. Everything from the macro-scale exploration to the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is massively expanded by the greater amount of freedom and decision-making. Unfortunately, I have somewhat of a hot take to offer when it comes to Super Metroid sequence breaking. Many of the sequence breaks are just performing the same kind of wall jumps over and over. In Super Metroid, how do you get Wave Beam early? You wall jump. What about early Spazer? You wall jump. Early Varia, do a wall jump. How do you get early gravity suit? Wall jump to it. What about power bombs? Jump this wall. I can't help but feel like the process of experimenting to discover the sequence breaks feels a bit samey to me. This is speaking as someone who is largely uninterested in counterintuitive sequence breaks that require online guides or external help. Specifically from the perspective of someone who likes to discover intuitive sequence breaks on their own, I think something like Metroid Dread offers a greater diversity of intuiting and discovering sequence breaking opportunities. To give you an idea of how this could be improved, Dread has speed boosting wall jumps, slide jumping, underwater shine sparking, shine sparking puzzles into diagonal surfaces with hidden pathways, morph ball shine sparking, and more. You have to try different things and solve each unique situation. Super has plenty of amazing stuff going on, but my hot take is that the actual process of discovering these breaks can often feel samey. Certain games like Dread or possibly even Zero Mission offer some more interesting ways to discover sequence breaks that aren't really there to the same extent in Super Metroid. Super Metroid has some completely nutty glitchy sequence breaks, and they're a ton of fun to see. But I'd much rather experience more diverse, intuitive sequence breaking just from trying to put the pieces together myself, exploring around and experimenting with my moveset. Getting early super missiles in Metroid Dread was such a memorable moment for me, not because some guy on YouTube showed me how to do it, and not because I performed my fifth basic wall jumping sequence break, but specifically because I had to go out there and figure everything out myself. This video isn't about Metroid Dread, but I bring up this comparison because Super Metroid has a reputation for being the untouchable gold standard of what sequence breaking should be. Sequence breaking perfected. I love the sequence breaking in Super Metroid, but it's just not my gold standard. I would be quite disappointed with Dread if it chose to have most of its intuitive breaks solved just by performing single wall scaling. I want to be challenged to try new things and experiment with what I think I can do. I'm not saying that Super Metroid doesn't have this, because it certainly does reward a lot of experimentation with its intuitive sequence breaking. It's just that from my perspective, the process of intuiting them feels more interesting in something like Dread. It's not that this is necessarily a problem in Super, I guess I'm just saying that there is room for improvement here. I know that this point especially is going to be highly subjective, because for many people, Super Metroid remains that untouchable gold standard for sequence breaking. What you might prefer largely depends on what you like about sequence breaking. I know I spent a lot of time criticizing some smaller aspects of Super's sequence breaking, but overall I am very positive on this aspect of the game. Super Metroid is mature enough to trust its more daring players to handle themselves with whatever they get themselves into with sequence breaking. Sequence breaking makes this game nearly endlessly replayable, and Super Metroid delivers on this potential with outstanding success. Super Metroid's excellent moment-to-moment -moment gameplay owes a lot of its success to the game's level design. Room layouts in Super Metroid are among the best in the entire series, so right off the bat, there's no repeated room layouts and basic empty hallways with nothing going on. The only thing that comes close are the rooms they had to borrow from the first Metroid game, and even there, they added as much as they could while preserving their original layout. Every single room of Super Metroid is unique and interesting, with thoughtful placement of platforms and enemies. This helps navigation tremendously, as players are provided a wealth of opportunity to take note of unique layouts and landmarks to categorize the many rooms of the game. Even these large, unique-looking statues are placed near important locations to make these rooms stand out through the level design. Since we're back on Zebus, many returning areas are given a new coat of paint with lots of variation and many pieces of environmental set dressing. Mushrooms, flowers, shrubs, twisting vines, mud pits, rocky spikes, and much more. Many naturalistic areas like the twisting caves are built with jagged rock formations and lots of irregularity. It's similar to Metroid 2's commitment to world believability, but there's also just much more going on in every room. Platforms and enemies are perhaps more plentiful than they ever have been before, but they are all placed in deliberate ways to complement the gameplay flow of traveling quickly through the world. Super Metroid's level design is also notable for having far more secrets than either of the first two games. 
There are so many destructible tiles, and there's just so much packed into each room. Many early game's secret destructible blocks are larger 2x2 tiles, increasing the likelihood that a player will shoot or bomb one to reveal a secret. Sometimes platforms are just destructible for seemingly no reason, but these don't waste your time like certain secret tiles in the first game. They just further add to the tactile and interactable qualities of the world in a way that has you carefully searching each room as you play through the game. You'd think that having far more secrets would mean that the world is more cryptic, but Super Metroid takes account for its design with many highly effective changes and additions to the gameplay. Previous innovations of course help, like tighter controls and more thoughtful secretive design, but Super Metroid has plenty of new tricks to offer to the player to facilitate intuitive secret searching and discovery. Two new power-ups mentioned previously are the power bombs and x-ray scope. One is infinite use, but requires a more deliberate scan of the world, the other is massive and quick, but is also a a limited resource. In practice, neither of these limitations will discourage you from using these very much because power bombs are quite easy to build a large stock of with the many expansions. X-ray scope stops you in place and requires you to physically look around the world to search for secrets, so it's a deliberate effort made by the player that is already suspicious of the presence of a nearby secret. One other thing that massively helps with secrets is that we at last finally have a map feature in our Metroid game. Super Metroid's map fills in as you explore different rooms, but you can also download maps of levels at hidden map stations. This optional downloadable map is incredibly useful for newcomers, as the minimap and menu map will show you blue rooms on the other side of walls. The map is a tremendously useful tool for indicating the general presence of a secret to the player, which only further reduces the likelihood of a player getting stuck. I'll get more into the map a bit later in the video, but here I'll just say that it too helps you search for secrets. Metroid as a series has a responsibility to balance getting lost with getting stuck. Many players don't even want to play the Metroid series because their patience and tolerance of being able to spend time backtracking and searching for hidden secrets is too low. I think there's nothing wrong with everyone having their own preferences, but my point is that everyone has a different idea about where that line is. Balancing an engaging navigational and searching challenge with valuing the player's time and not being too cryptic. Super Metroid certainly has a lot of hidden secrets, but I think this game is masterful at hinting these secrets to the player just enough to be intuited without wasting the player's time. Like I previously went over, we have things like the power bombs and the x-ray scope, but the big one is far more intuitive level design. Let's take another look at some of your progression when you first land on Zebus to demonstrate my point, this time with a greater focus on the level design itself. When you land on Zebus, your pathing options are very limited. Players are almost certain to quickly find the Morph Ball since so few pathways are available to them. Once you collect the Morph Ball, players are again trapped in a small area until they figure out how to use their newly acquired item. The game will continue to employ this trick with many more items, in order to guarantee that the player understands the application of their new item before they're let back out into the world. The map gradually expands as you collect more items, yes, but the first few secrets are pretty obvious, like these destructible blocks that lead to missiles or this Morph Ball hole that leads to bombs. Not only can can you easily spot this hole, but you can also see it on the nearby downloaded map. The game starts off easy, but it introduces a slightly more difficult secret after you get the bombs. These tiles on the left are drawn to be segmented from the rest of the cave, and you can see the edge of the ground continuing underneath them. They also resemble the blocks that you just broke to escape the lower area of this room. Additionally, the optional downloaded map will again show you the presence of more explorable areas on the other side of this wall so it's just a step above the previous secret in terms of difficulty. Continuing to Brinstar will show you many different pathways. You can't move quickly enough to pass through this closing gate, and you can't break this strange block at the bottom of this shaft. So there are secrets that the game is telling you about to try to get you to make a mental note of them for later. You are taught about the item contingent progression and introduced to concepts like backtracking through the level design itself. I'd like to use this room here in Brinstar to demonstrate one thing about Super Metroid's level design that makes its hidden guidance so seamless. The first pathway to the left of Brinstar will take you to a suspicious dead end, one that abruptly stops for no reason. The game has already introduced the concept of locked doors to the player earlier, but now they cannot escape this room for seemingly no reason. So Super Metroid is forcing you to stay in here until you can figure out that this suspicious dead end is actually a hidden path. Super Metroid doesn't want you falsely concluding that this dead end means nothing, so it's going to force you to use your intuition and learn something. It might not feel like it, but Super Metroid is still teaching things to you about the rules of its world. Once you bomb this hidden tile, 
tile, you can proceed to Brinstar's downloadable map. Exiting afterwards and defeating all of the creatures, including the creature on this side of the room, will unlock the door. The entire point of this door is to force the player to learn not only about the way secrets work, but it is also another chance for players to learn that defeating all of the enemies in a room can unlock doors. All of this is done wordlessly and intuitively. Super Metroid again demonstrates a commitment to immersion, player agency, and a commitment to respecting the player's time and intelligence. The game could have slowed things down with text boxes popping up explaining exactly how things work, but Super Metroid finds a more suitable way to communicate its ideas. Back to the progression, Super Metroid is placing the map at the very beginning of the first two areas to ease the player into the explorative challenges of this game. Contrast this against the next level, Norfair, where they don't let you download the map until after you get the power bombs. Conditioning players with the previous secrets and easing off of them as the game continues means that despite this delayed availability of Norfair's map, the player is prepared to handle the increased challenge to continue to discover secrets. The greater challenge of Norfair's secrets feel natural because the game has been very careful about preparing you for this. I won't go over the level design of every level, but I'll say that Super Metroid is very thoughtful with how it decides to balance its difficulty. Secrets are almost always telegraphed in some manner, such as with this tunnel being visible from above as you pass over it near the wrecked ship. You don't know exactly how you're going to get there, but you are made aware that there is some secret nearby to reach this tunnel. Enemies are also often placed in specific locations to reveal secrets, such as with this Zila in Brinstar, or these scissor crabs crawling out of fake tiles in Meridia. One of the most cryptic secrets of this game is perhaps this underwater pipe in the bottom of Meridia. The game shows you a broken pipe in the previous room, and the demo on the title screen will show you exactly what to do, but otherwise this is a fairly well-hidden secret. It's almost at the very end of the game, so I think it's appropriate for it to be as difficult as it is. Level design is far more interesting and accommodating for different types of players, but some areas do feel like they don't value the player's time. This one fake wall in Lower Norfair straight up lies to you when you look at it with the X-ray scope. Luckily, you are locked in a small segment of the map, so you're unlikely to wander off too far, and all you have to do to discover the secret is simply touch the wall or shoot certain weapons at it to notice they're passing through. It's lame that X-Ray lies to you, but it's really not a big deal in my opinion since there are still multiple other ways to discover this fake wall. The more offensive examples are a number of things about Meridia. This level features lots of quicksand, and I've never liked the way this sand feels to try to jump out of. It's more believable and realistic that quicksand would do this, but that doesn't mean that they should have designed it this way. Or realistic doesn't always mean more fun. I'd understand if they were going for some kind of platforming challenge to try to stay out of the quicksand, but especially with these sand falls pulling you into it, it just feels like you're going to be spending way too much time in the sand no matter what. I also really don't like this specific segment of the map, because Meridia has a couple one-way paths you have to take in order to get four expansion items. You have to do this large loop around the level multiple times just to get all of the items, and it's just annoying. One-way paths can work, but combined with Meridia's generally slower movement with the sand, this one-way, funnel-like design requires you to take the same long path so many times. Meridia is a notable overall weak point of the game in terms of navigation and platforming. The last two levels of the game, Lower Norfair and Turian, are both fairly linear affairs in that they have no item progression, few or no branching paths, and very little backtracking. The focus of these areas is more so on moment-to-moment -moment gameplay like combat, platforming, and searching for secrets in each room. Lower Norfair pulls this off pretty well because the secrets are interesting and the area features two boss fights and tough enemies. Lower Norfair has some really tough hidden tiles, but this is almost the very end of the game, so I think it's suitable for this level to really put the player's searching skills to the test. However, this also runs the risk of wasting the player's time if they think that they need an item somewhere else in the world. Turian concludes the game with tense Metroid encounters and some great story stuff that I won't go over here. The important takeaway of these two levels is that while they are far more linear than the rest of the game, they lean into the strengths of linear design by offering a more scripted game experience. Level design overall in Super Metroid is another tremendous high point of this game. It's really difficult for me to overstate the incredible achievement of Super Metroid's level design. Of course, the name of the game with Super Metroid is overcoming the navigation-focused challenge of Planet Zebus. Many talking points on this topic have already come up in previous segments, so I won't be repeating those here. There is an overall forward momentum to your progression in Super Metroid, but the game offers a good amount of optional and required backtracking as well. Backtracking as a concept has earned itself somewhat of a problematic reputation for some players, some going so far to say that it straight up ruins the game for them. Not that it really needs defending, but I'd like to take a moment to talk about why backtracking Tracking in Metroid is so important to the series. It's integral to Metroid's design because your game world is meant to
to be understood as a physical and believable world more than a simple obstacle course between points A and B. Fleshing out your game world doesn't just come from making it look more believable, but also making it play more believable. An explorative gameplay experience shouldn't just involve constant forward momentum. You should be able to get lost as you're asked to travel backwards in order to make progress. It feels tremendously rewarding to return to older areas with new abilities and try them out to see if you can overcome an obstacle. Backtracking is such an important piece of the gameplay specifically because of how it rewards the player for taking the entire world into account instead of just the here and now of the game. It all plays into treating the entire world as an interconnected and holistic experience not only through the level design, but also through your navigation and progression. Backtracking offers additional benefits, like demonstrating how powerful the player has become with new abilities by returning to older areas. You once struggled with defeating these early game enemies, but now you're effortlessly barreling through them without a second thought. This rewards the player for all of the progress that they've made, because you get to feel that power in older areas you've backtracked to. Backtracking also provides the opportunity to tell some kind of story about the world by showing a change in the environment when you return to older areas. The pirates that suddenly appear in the beginning of the game can only work specifically because you were backtracking through there. The music changes when you return to Criteria later in the game, which parallels how you are mastering your navigation and mastering your adventure as you become more powerful. The power turns back on in the wrecked ship, recontextualizing your explorative gameplay and revealing the power siphoning ability that Fantoon has in the lore. This concept isn't pushed as far as it would come to be in the sequel games, but there are at least moments of this here and there in Super. Backtracking can become exhausting depending on its execution and implementation, but Super Metroid accounts for this potential issue in multiple ways. For one, the game features many shortcuts and interconnected pathways to allow for lesser amount of backtracking overall. And when you do backtrack, the game will place in opportunities to use your new power-ups. My previously mentioned grapple swing blocks are one example, but other moves like the speed booster, high jump, and space jump integrate naturally into your basic movement. It's so satisfying zipping around so quickly through areas that used to give you a hard time in this game with your new movement abilities. Compare starting the game feeling so vulnerable and uncertain with your weak little pellets and limited moveset to barreling through the world with all of your abilities and having so many powerful cool attacks like power bombs and screw attack. Super Metroid does incentivize backtracking through its progression and world layout, but it also actively inhibits your backtracking with many one-way paths and blocking off older areas. Take any of the one-way gates, this lava pit in Norfair, these one-way sand pits in Meridia, or giant pits like this one in Red Brinstar. One advantage that Super Metroid has over the other Metroid games is that a good amount of these restrictions on your navigation can be bypassed with tricks like wall jumping. Earlier, I was comparing Super Metroid to Metroid Dread in order to show Super's potential for improvement. It's only fair that if I'm going to be making comparisons to future releases like that, then I should also give Super Metroid the credit it deserves for having unique advantages over even those games. Super Metroid manages to be simultaneously accommodating for newcomers with its one-way gates, but also freeing through its use of sequence breaks. Dread can be described in the same way, but Dread has a number of restrictions on your navigation that simply cannot be bypassed under any circumstances. It's a small difference, but that advantage affords Super Metroid just that slightest bit more of navigational non-linearity. Super Metroid has a unique offering to the advanced player through its commitment to player freedom. Super Metroid will let you get completely nuts with how far you take backtracking in its world. For example, once you get the speed booster in Super Metroid, you can use the wall jump to go all the way back to Criteria before you get the ice beam or high jump. You can even go back before getting the various suit if you're willing to attempt the heat run through Norfair. From there, you can even use the shine spark to get to the wrecked ship, so players can go out of their way and offer themselves a challenge in attempting to defeat Fantoon before Kraid. This is even possible not only because of the sequence breaking opportunities I previously discussed, but also because of the possibility to bypass restrictions on your navigation. Once again, Super Metroid demonstrates a synergy in its design aspects that come together in a unique and carefully crafted gameplay experience. Metroid Dread, as well as any other Metroid game, does not offer this kind of navigational freedom quite to the same extent that Super Metroid does, while also being so accommodating to the newcomer. There's no shame in falling short of Super in general, but Super Metroid deserves to be celebrated for its unique achievements in how far it's willing to take its design philosophies. Your first run of Super Metroid is likely to feel more full of backtracking than your subsequent runs, and this is because of the sequence breaking. Having to go back for Spazer, 
having to go back for wave beam, having to go back for power bombs, so much of the backtracking can be outright removed by the sequence breaking. Backtracking is massively contingent on your ability to break the sequence. It's intrinsically and extrinsically rewarding to master optimizing your routing, but I'll get into that more when I discuss speedrunning later. Super Metroid's navigation is massively improved in this game from having an in-game map. This map feature also utilizes downloadable maps to display unexplored areas to the player. I find a tremendous satisfaction in being able to track my own navigation in the pause menu, and I value being able to immediately identify where I have and haven't been in such a streamlined and organized way. Other pieces of information are available as well, such as the location of specific notable rooms like safe stations, elevators, recharge stations, or hidden items. As much as I appreciate all of the additions that Super Metroid makes by adding a map, I also can't help but notice all of the ways that the map could be so much better. The big one for me is that doors are not labeled on this map in any capacity. This actually is kind of a big deal for me since so much of your navigation is informed by the position of doors. For most of the map, you can make reasonable assumptions about where doors may and may not be, and you'll usually be able to guess correctly about how to reach a specific room. But the limitations of this map are brought to their breaking point by the time you get to Meridia. Meridia is so maze-like, dense, and complicated that not having doors labeled on the map can massively overcomplicate your navigation. You can see the room you want to get to, you can see many neighboring rooms, but you have no way of knowing how any of those rooms actually connect to each other without physically visiting them. Meridia is built in such a way that making your way around to troubleshoot this issue can make backtracking repetitive, like the previously mentioned one-way sand pits. Other parts of this map that I really don't like is that it straight up lies to you on multiple occasions. The map will, multiple times, show you a blank tile where there is actually a hidden item. Telling the player that there is nothing there when there is in fact something there frustrates me far more than it probably should. I really don't like that Super Metroid is so okay with straight up lying to the player like this, because this wastes a lot of time when the completionist is convinced that there's nothing noteworthy in that area. They're almost certain to search elsewhere, looking for new unexplored pathways on the map. The reality is that the location they're searching for was on the map the whole time, and the game decided to lie for no good reason. Maps also do not make any separation between collected and uncollected items, which again just wastes more time. The map also only lets you view the level that you're currently standing in. You must travel to other levels just to view their maps. You can really tell that this is their first attempt at a map for Metroid. In my opinion, this map is not nearly detailed enough to be as useful as it should be and the fact that it several times just lies to you is completely silly. The map has a much greater impact on your navigation than you may initially suspect, and Super Metroid's navigation as a whole is impacted by my issues with this map. There is certainly room for improvement within individual things, like the world not changing much when you backtrack, or the lacking new map feature, but overall, Super Metroid's navigation is handled very well. Yet another high point for Super Metroid. Combat may not be the focus of the experience, but it's still very much a prevalent game feature that takes up much of your time. Combat in Super Metroid is somewhat of a step up from Metroid 2. The dynamic between the player and the common enemies is largely the same, for better and worse. One notable thing about Samus's arsenal is that beams now stack effects rather than being separate weapons. You can enable and disable beams in the inventory screen, and you can even turn any power up on and off anytime. Stacking beams may simplify the decision-making process, but it is a small price to pay for the far more streamlined beam progression. Actually going for each beam finally feels worth it, and beams only make you more powerful instead of being more of a trade-off. This design improvement comes more from the inventory screen than it does beam stacking specifically, as different equipable beams certainly could have and would go on to work in other Metroid games. Stackable beams certainly has its own appeal in streamlining the beam weapons. Many enemies and enemy patterns return from the first two games, like the Sidehoppers, Zoomers, Shriek Bats, Mellows, Rios, Dragons, Violas, and the Shoot Leeches. I don't feel the need to re-explain these enemies since we already went over them in the previous videos, and their patterns are largely identical to their previous iterations. Some of the new enemies are so basic that they're really not worth going over, like the Zeros, Puyos, or Skullteras. To sum up all of these guys, I can say they might have unique movement patterns, but the dynamic never goes beyond simply pressing the fire button a couple of times to watch them die. Certain movement patterns are more interesting, like the Space Pirates can climb along walls, block shots, shoot, 
and jump around. It's their first in-game appearance, and they work well to elevate the threat of their faction and expand the lore of the universe through the gameplay. They feel more intelligent than other enemies of the game because they respond to your attacks in a greater variety of ways. Key Hunters are interesting for being one of the higher HP early game enemies that punish you for just standing there and shooting. You need to have a more powerful shot ready, or you need to jump over them as they swoop in to swipe you. Boyons see effective utilization through the Ice Beam in numerous rooms, making them more of a platforming challenge and even a little bit of a light puzzle. Work Robots fulfill a similar purpose, being used for a puzzle where you need to push them around into specific spots. The mysterious coverns of the wrecked ship look especially creepy and surprise you with their sudden appearance in seemingly random locations. Magdalites work well to test the player's evasion, as do the cack attacks. Fire fleas obstruct your platforming, but killing them makes the room darker since their glow is the only source of light. There's a dynamic of deciding whether or not to kill them to make your platforming easier at the cost of lowering your visibility. There are a few creatures that aren't even enemies, like the previously mentioned Edicoons and Dakoras. These guys offer Samus help, and their behavior is mysterious and unique. The Tatori seems to try to protect its babies with a ram attack. It's a one-of-a-kind creature that stands out for its unique behavior and light puzzle-solving gameplay. I could say the same of this strange, one-of-a-kind, wall-climbing, digging robot that you can find in the depths of Meridia. These more rare and unique enemies make Super's world feel like some kind of bizarre ecosystem more than a simple video game level. It adds an extra bit of believability to the world, as not everything is simply out to kill Samus. They have unique applications in the game world and behave in ways that real-world animals might, like protecting their young. Metroids return, and they are easier than ever, and I cannot place exactly why. Maybe it's the stacking beams and enhanced moveset, but I'm not certain about this. I won't repeat myself about what makes Metroid so great, I'll just say that Super largely captures what made them so appealing in the first two games. The enemy encounters are largely the same as the previous two games, though there is certainly a greater variety in types and gameplay applications with new memorable behaviors. Enemies in Metroid tend to function as set dressing of the environment more than mechanical challenges and I'm completely okay with this. I'm not asking for every enemy to be a challenging combat encounter, but in Super Metroid it feels like even the fewer and more powerful late game enemies fail to engage me. Take these big guys in Lower Norfair. This area is a straight shot focused on challenging the player. This would be the perfect place to put some mechanically engaging enemy encounters. These guys might take more hits, but the combat remains uninteresting. I'm okay with bosses carrying the burden of being the focus of your more challenging and interesting combat encounters. Enemies generally shouldn't be very time-consuming or challenging in order to preserve pacing. Having every single enemy challenge you would quickly become exhausting in a Metroidvania-style game, so it's great that so many of the enemies are designed as they are. With that said, that doesn't mean that Metroid shouldn't have the occasional tough enemy to keep combat interesting. Perhaps more mini-bosses, for example. Despite being the best combat in the series yet, Super Metroid's enemy encounters still largely feel like going through the motions more than mechanically interesting encounters overall. I haven't been very kind to the bosses of the first two Metroid games, and unfortunately, I don't think Super Metroid wows me with its bosses either. In terms of presentation, all of these guys are absolutely outstanding. They are big and scary, and they all genuinely freaked me out as a kid. The sounds that they make sound like something out of a Godzilla movie, and I've always adored everything about these bosses except for the actual gameplay. I'll go in the order of the encounters. I already discussed your first encounter with Ridley in the beginning, so let's start with the first Torizo. Everyone already knows about the excellent twist with the statue coming to life, completely catching you off guard. I think this is such an interesting twist to something players associate as one of the only unequivocally good and safe things in Metroid games. It's easy to look at this game decades later and forget about how nuts it is to have a Chozo statue stand up and fight you like this. <laughs> yeah! Uh oh, I'm scared. Oh. Already, this guy has more going on than any of the bosses from the first two games. The Torizo has various swiping and projectile attacks, and he makes for a good first real boss. His eggs can be shot to replenish resources, and his head falls off once you do enough damage, which just further adds to how freaky he is. He's dripping some kind of liquid, so he might be alive, but he also loses his head and keeps fighting. The game doesn't really make this clear, but you can actually use the Morph Ball to roll between his legs to dodge his attacks. This kind of Morph
nerf ball utilization in combat is so cool to me, and I wish Metroid in general did this more often. The Chorizo goes down pretty quickly, but he makes for an excellent first boss. Next is easily the worst boss in the game, Spore Spawn. He swings back and forth and forces you to just hang out and wait for him to periodically open himself to deal some damage. Shoot the spores to keep your ammo count high and repeat until he dies. This boss is my least favorite boss because the pacing of the fight is entirely in the boss's hands, and it decides to slow things down to a crawl. Additionally, the AI just doesn't go beyond swinging back and forth. There is virtually no challenge or interesting gameplay here. This might as well be a waiting room. Spore Spawn is creepy, and I really like the visuals, but that doesn't save this boss for me. The moaning sound made when it opens has always unsettled me, and it's the only boss in the game where the music keeps playing after the boss dies. The entire room drains its color, which reveals such an otherworldly relationship with Spore Spawn's connection to the immediate ecosystem. It's so weird in the coolest way. Prayed needs no introduction. One cool part that has been kind of lost to time is this moment where you are approaching Kraid's room and you run into this mini Kraid. He's about the same size as the Kraid from the NES game, so NES players are almost certain to mistake this guy for the real Kraid. Pushing forward and seeing this surprise colossal monstrosity is a great moment because of this bait and switch. Super Metroid has plenty of moments like this that are only going to fully work if you're familiar with the first two games, like exploring Old Turian. An unfortunate consequence of remaking these games is that some of these moments no longer work, as Zero Mission players are fully expecting big Kraid. Either way, the actual boss fight itself is perfectly serviceable. Kraid's only weak point is the inside of his mouth, and you're going to need to dodge his projectiles to stay in the optimal location to deal damage. Shooting his eyes will open his mouth, and you have a limited time to get your damage in. Dodge his belly spikes, his flying fingernails, and the rocks he belches. There's really not much else going on here. Kraid's relative simplicity gets by on the excuse that he has fought so early in the game, but even so, I think the fight could be made more interesting. Krakomire is notable for being completely unable to defeat through sheer damage. He doesn't actually have a health value to be depleted. It's almost like a tug of war in that he needs to push you back into his bed of spikes and you need to push him forward into a pit of acid. Like Kraid, only his open mouth can be damaged to push him away. Once again, I think this guy is not nearly complex enough to stay interesting. I feel like I can just go on autopilot with this guy because he doesn't have very many attacks, just spitting these fireballs and swiping his arms in front of him. The more simple bosses work for the early game, but once you get into the mid game and late game, it feels like the bosses need to evolve further to stay interesting. Krakomire, despite his more unique tug-of-war dynamic, feels like he fails to keep me fully engaged since his AI and moveset never evolve. For what it's worth, he is one of the more mechanically unique bosses of the game, and he looks really cool. Fantoon is a bit more of an interesting fight in that he actually does a fair amount of damage compared to the number of available energy tanks. The attacks themselves aren't very interesting, as he mostly just randomly throws bouncing fireballs around. He'll keep his vulnerable eye closed most of the time, again making the pacing of the fight almost entirely up to the boss instead of the player. He'll punish the player that uses super missiles with a unique fire wave attack, which does add a small layer of dynamicism to the fight. The margin of error is more narrow than it has ever been just from the high damage attacks, but Fantoon's actual attack patterns are nothing special and similarly too samey and basic to hold my interest. Batwoon is my second least favorite fight just for flying around randomly from hole to hole and spitting projectiles. He gets faster as his health gets lower, but he does absolutely nothing else. This guy is completely forgettable for having almost nothing going on. Dragon is by far my favorite fight in the game. For one, it can be damaged at basically any time it's on screen, placing the pacing back into the hands of the player. Shoot its soft belly and try to avoid its swooping attacks. Once again, Morph Ball is used as an evasive maneuver during combat encounters. It can spit a barrage of webbing to ensnare you, and it will follow up with a grab to sting you repeatedly. Mash the buttons to escape faster, and think outside of the box to efficiently dispose of the webbing. Of course, there's the secret quick kill in which you bait Dragon into grabbing you and then grapple beam an exposed circuit to melt its health. This quick kill is so cool because it rewards that kind of experimentation and out-of-the-box thinking that I value so much in Metroid. It sounds like some kind of rumor you'd hear on the playground, and it's fascinating that it turns out to be true. Like Fantoon, Dragon hits pretty hard, so the tension is higher than other bosses. Dragon gets much faster when it's low on health, which helps keep the fight more interesting to the end. Dragon's 
stands out to me for keeping tension high and rewarding you for trying different moves, like the Morph Ball, Power Bombs, or Grapple Beam during a boss fight. Everything comes together very nicely here to show how good Metroid bosses could and should be with Dragon. Ridley is unfortunately quite the letdown for me. It's actually one of my lesser favorites in the game. He just swipes his tail at you and breathes fireballs, but there's not much of any telegraphing here. It's a messy fight that becomes difficult to approach methodically. Speedrunners prove that it can be done, but this feels more like AI exploitation than any actual telegraph readings. This fight comes closer to the Rock'em Sock'em Robot dynamic of the first two games than any other fight in Super. I've heard this used as a positive because it demonstrates Ridley's unique characterization. Ridley doesn't play by the rules of the game because his fight is messy and cannot be approached very methodically. It puts him on a unique playing field that separates him from other bosses. I can see the value in that, but I don't think it's a worthwhile trade-off. I'd rather a more mechanically rich fight that rewards skilled play without having to go so far as to exploit his AI. Ridley kind of kills my motivation to attempt a low percent run because of how random his behavior is, and I don't care to learn AI exploits just to stand a chance against him. I'll always prefer intuiting things myself. Ridley acts as some kind of progression gate where players are asked to collect enough of the expansions to afford tanking the hits. Ridley asks you to make your avatar strong instead of making your skills better, and that's exactly why I don't care for this Fight. I believe expansions should widen the margin of error, not merely make a fight possible. Facing Ridley is a very satisfying moment in the narrative, and Ridley's status as an equal to Samus does offer its own appeal, but this still goes against my preferences in a way that leaves me unsatisfied with this boss encounter from a gameplay perspective. The last battle to talk about is the final boss fight against Mother Brain. This fight is relatively easy, because Mother Brain's first phase isn't nearly as busy as its NES counterpart, and the player is so much more capable than they were in the first game. There's really not much to this first phase, but I think the whole idea is that the player is meant to feel powerful before the game pulls the rug out from under you. Once Mother Brain reveals her final form, the player needs to do enough damage not to defeat her, but to trigger an interactive story segment. Mother Brain will use various projectiles and these delayed bombs against the player, which isn't nearly enough to make this encounter as challenging as you might expect from a final boss. The damage values are decently high on her moves, but they just aren't fast or dynamic enough to be very interesting to me from a mechanical perspective. This boss fight is much more concerned about being an interactive narrative experience more than a proper boss fight and it certainly achieves its goal with outstanding success. With that said, I don't think that these two goals are mutually exclusive. We could have received an interesting boss that ends with a scripted, interactive story. I'm mostly okay with this fight being as scripted as it is, but that only places even more weight on the earlier Ridley fight to be a more mechanically engaging experience. From a storytelling perspective, this scene is incredible for its interactivity and emotional payoff with the roller coaster that is watching the Super Metroid sacrifice itself to save Samus's life, and then being able to absolutely decimate Mother Brain. The Mother Brain fight is a satisfying payoff for what was built over the last two games, and it all ties up nicely. The story makes no attempt to explain or even hint at any explanation of why characters like Ridley, Kraid, and Mother Brain are back, which nobody seems to mind here for some reason. Segments like Ceres and the Mother Brain fight remain special for having a level of interactivity otherwise unseen in the series that benefits concepts like player agency and immersion. So, bosses overall are certainly yet another step up from the first two games. The presentation surrounding them is immaculate, but the actual gameplay mechanics are hardly memorable or interesting overall. Krokemire is a standout boss for doing something mechanically unique, and Dragon is genuinely fantastic. Damaging the bosses is generally approached the same way every time, as super missiles are always the definitive choice for all but one encounter. No matter what boss it is, your dynamic will never change beyond starting with your supers, switching to missiles, then firing charge shots until the boss is dead. There's not much in the way of decision making when it comes to determining how to attack a boss. I'm not against the idea of super missiles being their own consumable item, but you can collect so many of them here that they don't really feel like a powerful and rare resource. Despite their unfavorable comparison to the future releases, there is still a lot to appreciate about Super Metroid's bosses as a whole. Combat overall undeniably plays second fiddle to exploration in Super Metroid. Many are perfectly okay with this, but I don't see this as a necessary evil of the Metroid formula. Good combat and good exploration are not mutually exclusive, as demonstrated by future releases within this series. Combat is merely a pillar of a larger game experience, yes, but here in Super Metroid, this pillar is noticeably weak. 
I'm not interested in giving combat a pass just because it's not the primary focus of this game. I'm not here to make it out like Super Metroid is a bad game just because I don't love its combat, but I am saying that Super Metroid's combat is comparatively weak not only to other Metroid games, but also other action games of its era. I don't agree that Super Metroid needed to have less interesting combat in order to fully realize its goals as a good Metroidvania, because like I said, I don't see these concepts as mutually exclusive. Perhaps it's the best that they could have done in 1994, but that doesn't mean it's going to hold up today very well. An improvement over the first two Metroid games, but nothing special. Super Metroid is the Metroid game that really sold me on the concept of Metroid's potential to offer an immersive experience. Immersion in video games can come in many forms, like first-person 3D games or even VR games where you physically look around and use your hands to interact with the game world. This is all well and good, but to end the discussion of immersion there would be a massive disservice to the accomplishments of games like Super Metroid. The immersive appeal of a game like Super Metroid is that the game has fully engrossed me into its game world as a, in a sense, believable space. Super Metroid is nowhere near realistic, but it is very committed to being believable. Believable is more about logical consistency, and the game world showing a proper history with things like signs of age, like ancient civilizations or other forms of environmental storytelling. So many of the design goals of Super Metroid have been in service of selling Super's world as a tangible and real place that could physically exist. The freedom afforded by the sequence breaking and interconnected world design immerse the player because they force you to think of the game world as a holistic world that you can map out as a tangible space. There's no level select or mission-based structure, no explicit lengthy tutorials, and no gamey visuals or sound effects. Your guidance through the world is invisible, and this has everything to do with immersion. Your navigation and progression, despite being more linear than you might realize, feel like they are entirely in your hands. Player agency immerses the player because it is now your journey in this believable world. You aren't told where to go or what to do, you are just given the bare minimum and left to figure everything out on your own. This might also offer its own mechanical benefits, but the immersive benefits are profound. If the player is given objective markers, waypoints, or clutter on their heads-up display showing them where to go or what to do, then the player is kept keenly aware of the fact that they're playing a video game. Of course, nobody is actually going to forget that they are playing a game, but committing to believability can offer a unique type of mental and emotional connection to the game world. Super Metroid is certainly not the only game to do this, but Metroid offers a unique, mechanically rich gameplay experience alongside a more immersive experience. Just like its commitment to marrying Mario and Zelda, Metroid's very foundation is to balance mechanically substantive gameplay with more emotionally appealing concepts like immersion, atmosphere, and narrative. Not every facet of Super Metroid's design is committed to immersion. Super Metroid is certainly not an immersive sim game. It may not have immersive qualities like a virtual reality first-person perspective game, or things like a diegetic heads-up display. Plenty of things about its design are outright antithetical to immersive design, like its tile-based level design and especially these blocks with item icons on them. Super Metroid may offer a unique immersive gameplay experience, but its priority is to be a good Metroidvania first and foremost. Super Metroid remains timeless to this day for its outstanding success with balancing these concepts. Even 2D Metroid offers its own special kind of immersion and I think Super Metroid captures this better than any other 2D game, period. Another advantage it has over even other 2D Metroid games. Super Metroid uses its expansion pickups to make a fantastic experience with its optional items. There are far more expansions in Super than either of the first two games, with 46 missile tanks, 10 super missile tanks, 10 power bomb tanks, 14 energy tanks, 4 reserve tanks, and various optional items like the spacer and spring ball. Super Metroid, of course, gives you a few generous placements to communicate to players that secrets like these can be found, and to guarantee that players have at least a little more than the bare minimum health and missiles. As per usual, expansions are usually found at dead ends of pathways and hidden within many rooms like connecting tunnels and larger areas. But what really makes Super Metroid's expansions stand out is that so many of them are thoughtfully placed to challenge the player in some interesting way. Some challenge your platforming with small landings, enemies, and lava pits. Others test your ability to pick up on subtle clues. Some just straight up do not hint at their presence, and it's up to you to look over rooms carefully. I am more forgiving of this cryptic design here because of the tools that the game affords you, like the x-ray scope and power bombs. Especially since these more cryptic ones are optional, it's difficult for me to get that mad at how well hidden they are. Though this does make my issues with the map even worse. I don't have all day to go over every expansion, but I do want to mention a few especially memorable ones. I 
previously mentioned that certain enemies are used for light puzzle solving, like freezing these boyons to create a runway for your shine spark. Similar situation with some worker robots in the wrecked ship. I like that this flower in Red Brinstar is missing a yapping maw, hinting the presence of a secret to the player. This one pipe in Green Brinstar doesn't shoot out any enemies, hinting that you can actually jump inside of it. There are a lot of great little hidden expansions like this that require you to observe your environment carefully, and it makes for more interesting gameplay as you search through each room. I already complained about these four expansions in Meridia that require you to loop the entire level several times, but there are also these two missile tanks that are placed on either side of some falling blocks. If you don't step on the exact center of these falling blocks, then you have to do this entire loop you just did a second time for no good reason. These six expansions are a pain, but the rest range from fine to great. One thing I really like about the placement of the expansions in this game is that many of them are available your first time through an area. Brinstar does have many tanks that can only be collected later in the game. This means that your expansion collection isn't bookended to the end of the game. Super makes most of these expansions available much earlier than that. This helps keep the pacing even and makes for a more engaging 100% experience. Super Metroid actually does show you your item percentage collection, but it's only after you beat the game. I believe that only offering the item percentage after the game is completed is also a needless waste of the player's time. That stuff should be right on the map, and it should show item totals on a per level basis. Having a map at all is tremendously useful, but it really does fumble quite a few things that make Super Metroid's completion experience feel comparatively lacking. I don't want to take away from the innovations that Super Metroid does make, but you can tell this is their first attempt at a map. There are a wealth of features missing from this first game that put it in an unfavorable lighting when compared to many of the sequel games, though it is an improvement over the first two games. One thing that seriously hurts the 100% completion experience is that the final save room of the game in Torian has a problem. Even though this save room looks completely inconspicuous as any other save room would look, saving here actually prevents you from returning to the rest of the game world. There is one door that locks permanently once you pass through it, so once you save here, you can't ever 100% your save file if you didn't already. There is absolutely no good reason for this save room to punish the player so harshly just for deciding to save. What's worse is that if the player happens to miss the charge beam, and they don't have enough missiles to defeat the final boss, then the game becomes permanently and and completely unbeatable. This hypothetical player is left with no choice but to completely restart their save file from the very beginning of the game, just because they didn't grab enough missiles, didn't grab charge beam, and decided to save before the final boss. Though it's not likely to happen, this is something that absolutely should not be so easy to trigger in the first place. 100%ing this game is easily the most fun yet, and even today it remains an engaging experience as long as you know about the quirks with things like the map. What do I even say about Super Metroid speedrunning? Are you serious? Super Metroid is one of the most popular speedrunning games of all time, and it's one of the first games players attempted to run. All of the familiar elements of Metroid NES's speedrunning potential remain true of Super Metroid, such as the wealth of opportunity for route optimization and decision making involved in deciding how many items to collect or skip. The map is expansive and maze-like, and features many hidden shortcuts. The decision making involved in Metroid NES was great, but it pales in comparison to the complexity of Super Metroid's speedrunning optimization opportunity. There's just so much more to consider with Super Metroid. As I've kept saying, a huge appeal of the Metroid series is figuring out this kind of stuff myself. Yes, you could use the internet to find the most optimal path, but I found tremendous enjoyment in analyzing and experimenting with the game world to determine the fastest route myself. You need just enough items to beat the game, and you must evaluate items based on how long they take to reach, and compare that amount of time spent to their usefulness in your run. Each item acquired is a trade-off of time. For example, a player might want to stop to grab the nearby super missile tanks when they reach the wrecked ship. This will certainly help you quickly dispatch upcoming bosses, but taking the time to go out of your way to grab these tanks might be more time than it's worth. How many tanks do you stop to grab, and which tanks cost the least amount of time? Figuring out every last detail is the name of the game with Super Metroid speedrunning, an endlessly replayable experience. Of course, having a smaller health and ammo count means that the margin of error is narrow. You simply cannot afford to tank hits and spam your powerful weaponry in the same way you could with a normal run. Even basic enemies suddenly pose a much greater threat as a result. Skipping items like the grapple beam and wave beam mean that your traversal options are more limited, and you must account for this in your routing. You can also cut down tremendously on your backtracking by sequence breaking, such as with grabbing power bombs on your first visit to Red Brinstar. There is no greater way to demonstrate your mastery of this game world than to optimize your routing to beat this game quickly.
Super Metroid's impact on the game industry and Metroidvania genre is undeniable. The game furthers the series so much that many consider it difficult to look back at what came before. This is the definitive Metroid experience and definitive video game period for so many players, and it's really easy for me to see why. The game embraces the non-linear design of the first game, but introduces a new focus on item progression that evolves the gameplay formula into something I, and many others, can't get enough of. Combine that with its evolved take on the world building of the second game and its entirely new set of design ideas, and it's easy to see how Super Metroid managed to earn itself its reputation. The game has some notable issues like its shine sparking, item selection and jumping controls, lackluster combat, deceiving final save room, lackluster item tracking, and its bare bones and dishonest map. It's clear that basically all of these issues hardly bother many because this game is often touted as the literal perfect Metroid game. Personally, I don't think this game is all that Metroid should be, and I also think that other Metroid games have found plenty of original ways to surpass some design aspects of this game. Taken for what it is, I think that Super Metroid nearly perfects the design philosophy of the more non-linear map design and progression. It may not be my favorite game in the series, but it's definitely in my top three games of all time. Even to this day, Super Metroid remains unique for things like its specific flavor of item progression focused gameplay, or its commitment to interactivity and immersion. Every design aspect of Super Metroid is in service of its design philosophy of granting the player agency in their progression. This is done within a world carefully balanced to accommodate both newcomers and veteran players alike. The synergy between all of Super Metroid Metroid's design aspects come together to offer an endlessly replayable experience that I will continue to frequently revisit in the future. Thank you for watching this video, and I'll smell you later.